John begins his gospel this way, talking to us about how God has come to us in Jesus Christ the Lord. Here's how he explains it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him, not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. And that's the word of the Lord. Amen. Christmas is about home. When I think of Christmas, I think of home. I think of where I grew up in Chambly, Georgia, and being together as a family in Chambly, Georgia, around a Christmas tree that we had gone and picked out for ourselves and actually cut it down and spent hours and hours of engineering to get it to stand up straight in the stand, only to find the next morning that it had tilted and we straightened it again and put water and it had the big Christmas bulbs. Do you remember the big Christmas bulbs? When I think of Christmas, I think of home and I think of my dad's punch. We didn't drink a lot. My parents didn't drink a lot as I grew up a little, but not much. But at Christmas, they drank. My dad would make punch and he would pour enough bourbon into his punch to float a battleship. And my mother was mindful that we were children, so she only let us drink just a little bit of Dad's punch. But she would let us eat all the fruit that we wanted out of it. Yeah, Mom didn't know. So I spent a lot of Christmases as an eight and nine-year-old, just three sheets to the wind. <laughs> I didn't even know why. I think of Christmas, I think of home. When I think of Christmas, I think of the home that Lisa and I have created together, and really applause and kudos to Lisa. I think of days in Covington, Georgia, when Lisa would pull out the Christmas decorations and decorate the house and decorate the Christmas tree, and the boys would come downstairs to see what Santa Claus brought for Christmas, and I had been up through the night trying to put nuts and bolts on a bicycle or on other toys that they played with for 10 or 15 minutes. <laughs> when I think of Christmas, I think of home. I think of food. Lisa doesn't just love to cook, but on Christmas she cooks and she puts together cheese grits. I feel sorry for Yankees on Christmas morning. Don't eat cheese grits and 
bacon and sausage. We can eat anything we want. All the rules of diet and health go out the window on Christmas morning. When I think of Christmas, I think of home and food and eggnog, and now I think of Alpharetta, Georgia, and Christmas will be a little bit different for us this year. Sort of touches my sad spot. Aaron got married to a girl from San Antonio. And so this year when we gather for Christmas, for the first time in our lives, Aaron won't be home. He'll be in San Antonio with his other family, with Victoria's family. And I think that's well and good and important and I wish them well and we'll FaceTime and talk on the phone but it'll be a little different Christmas is about home and about family being home many travel during the Christmas season just to get home and go to great trouble people fly in from Kansas City for the Christmas Eve service last year a lady flew in from Kansas City I says what it's cold in Kansas City when you left this morning she says does 14 degrees sound okay to you I said no ma'am makes me crave Arizona and people get in cars and automobiles because at Christmas time we want to be together. Did I get that right? And we want to be home. For some, we'll be missing. People have died and things change. You can't FaceTime. You just have to hold faith in God, stir in your heart good memories. And so if that's you this year, I wish for you good memories of home and the presence and peace of God. Christmas is about home. I hope Christmas is about worship. It's family for you. That as people come home, you're already thinking of Christmas Eve services or the Eve Eve service where you can be together in a pew and acknowledge that we all belong to God and love God and that something of coming home is turning our face toward God. Christmas is about home. It's about coming home. And John says that Christmas is about God coming home to us. That God has chosen to move into our neighborhood. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. It's high and lofty language, but it's John's way of saying God has come home to us. That God loves us and cares for us in the way that you want to be home with your children, that God wants to be home with his children. And so he's traveled traveled great distance and come to us and his son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to be home with us. The most familiar Bible verse in all of Christendom is for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And we think of the cross, but you can think of Christmas too, that God gave us his son and that God still loves the world. God didn't love the world for a moment and then stop and say he's over us, throw us away like orphans or people. Christmas, says John, is God coming home to us in the flesh to be with us, to help us, to strengthen us, to let us know that he cares about us, that he understands us. And God, at times, can be so distant, feel so distant from us. Last Sunday evening, I was in Arizona. I went to a place called the Desert Botanical Gardens, and they light up cactus and do a light show and there's music and something to drink that warms you up although it's really not quite that cold in Arizona and as we walked we got to a dark place and there was a person with a telescope there and they were letting people look through the telescope and you could see Mars the person would point it would be a light flickering in the sky but in the telescope it was orange it was a dot and you could see that it was not a star it was a planet which was fascinating to me. And then she turned the telescope to a constellation called Pleiades. I think I'm saying that correctly. If there's astronomers in the congregation, you can correct me in the vestibule, and I apologize for being a clown and a redneck. But she put it on the constellation, and she said something about the stars, and then said that constellation of stars is 1,800 light years away which means that light has been traveling at almost 350,000 miles per second for 1800 years to touch our eyes 
And she went on to say, probably some of the stars that you're seeing this evening no longer exist. They're probably gone. What a distance. What a vast universe we live in. I cannot comprehend or fathom it. John says that in Jesus of Nazareth, born in Bethlehem, God has closed the distance and come to us. Pitched his tent in our camp. Bought a house in our neighborhood. Why? Because he sees the trouble we're in. He sees the mess we've made out of the world that we're in. He sees the mess that we make of our own lives from time to time and don't know how to get out of that mess. And in love and kindness and mercy, God has closed the distance and come home to us to help us and to use Luke's language unto us this day in the city of David is born a Savior who is Christ the Lord. God has come to help us and to be with us, not standing at a distance, just letting us do our own thing. The God of the universe who can in one skip be 1,800 light years away has come to Bethlehem and to Alpharetta and to live among us, to strengthen us, help us in our temptations. Sometimes we're tempted to do wrong things. Does that happen to you? Tempted to do wrong things. I don't know why when we get distant from home and friends and familiar, temptation takes on a whole different nature. I was in Arizona this week and somebody tempted me and I thought, I'm a long way from home. I can do whatever I want. And then I thought, I belong to Christ and Christ came to me and is for us strength and direction and power so that we can live as children of God. God has come home to us and closed the distance and is full of grace and truth. God has come to speak to us. Oh, John struggled to say who Christ was and what Christ was all about. He struggled and he went through the dictionary and he combed through the dictionary and he combed through the dictionary and he combed through his memories of Jesus Christ. And in trying to describe what God has done in Jesus Christ, John put it this way. The word of God became flesh and dwelt among us. God came to speak to us. Not down to us or at us, but with us. With a message that matters. That matters. When I first stepped into the com com computer world, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know anything about the computer world. And I would fill out forms and people would ask for my email address. And you know what I would do? I would give them my email address. I don't do that anymore. Can I tell you why? Because now when I click on my mail, the first thing I have to do is delete 147 messages that are meaningless. So now I give them your email address. <laughs> meaningless, meaningless messages. God with us and Jesus Christ coming to home to us is a meaningful message full of grace and truth. I need grace. I like the law. I appreciate the law. I don't want to live in a world where the law of Moses is disdained and thrown under the bus. There are some things we simply should not do. Do you agree? If we do them, there are consequences. There are some things that we should do. Honor the Sabbath. Honor God. Honor mother and father. Some of the commandments of Moses are very positive and we do those things our life is on the straight and narrow and it leads to abundance and nourishment and prosperity and long marriages and long life with family i'm grateful to god for moses but i more than the law i i, I need grace i need to know that i'm forgiven and that there's mercy with god when i stray and when we stray I have two pair of jeans hanging in my closet right now. One is the law, 
the other's grace. One used to fit just perfectly when I was in my 30s and 40s. I just can't bear to throw them away. But when I put them on, they tell me every cookie I ever ate. They declare to me the law and the facts. They lay down the law for me. Do you have such a pair of jeans? Then next to him hangs a pair of jeans that I call grace. I went and I told the man, he says, what size are you, Mr. Martin? I said, well, I'm a 38, but a 40 feels so comfortable, I'd really like to get a 42. (laughs) And they're full of grace because I put them on and they're like silk lined. That's God. That doesn't mean that God's just like ollie ollie in free, go and do whatever you want to, no consequences. Come on, we're grown-ups, we know better than that. But God gives mercy to us and grace to us and extends kindness to us because he wants us to be close to him because he knows there's strength in relationship with him he wants us around him and he wants to be in our hearts and in our lives he knows that's the difference I like grace do you like grace parents are the law parents are the law grandparents are grace do you see the difference Both our sons are married now, and I guess if life unfolds as normal, I'll be a grandfather in a year or two or five. I don't know. But I am now the grandparent of the most beautiful grand dog you've ever seen. And Aaron and Victoria are his parents, but I'm his grandparent. They lay down the law when he walks and what he eats and he sleeps in a crate. But that's not the way it is with his grandparent. His granddad has a little piece of bacon in his pocket all the time. They wonder why little Bo likes to sit in my lap all the time. It's because in my left pocket are two pieces of bacon that they don't know about. I like grace. Do you like grace? That says you are forgiven. Jesus said to the woman caught in adultery, You're forgiven. Go, don't behave that way anymore. I need grace. We need grace and kindness and mercy. John says, Jesus Christ, the word, was born, and he brings to us light, light. Are you scared of the dark? I don't know that I'm scared of the dark, but I really do love a flashlight. You know what I mean? Aaron bought me for Christmas last year a flashlight that has 1,200 lumens. What that means is I can stand here and click that flashlight on and see all the way to Roswell. That's what it means. I don't like the dark when I'm out in the woods hunting, turkey hunting, deer hunting, or going somewhere through the woods. I don't like the dark. I like the light. One candle, just one candle, just that candle has 12 and a half lumens of light. But the light beats the darkness every time. Just light one candle and the darkness, boom, it's done. It loses. And Jesus, says John, Christ, the Word made flesh, dwells among us, turns on the light and shows us the face of God. Jesus even said it. He said, Philip, have I been with you so long that you don't understand that when you've seen me, you've seen the Father? And so we understand that God loves and cares for us. He's the Father waiting on the porch. That's who God is. That's who God is. He's the good shepherd out turning over every rock, looking under every bush to find us. That's who God is. When you're lost, that matters. Christ shines a light and he tells us who he wants us to be. He tells a story of a Samaritan who stops and helps and says this is what it means to be a Christian. It means to be a neighbor. That's what John says. God comes home to us at Christmas is what John says. But probably the most important thing that John says is the reason that Christ came is so that he can be born within us. Born in our hearts and lives through faith. And by believing in him, we have new strength. We become a new creature. We have a new friend. We have a new savior. And our life is different. To those who receive him, who believe in him, he gives power, strength to live as the children of God. 
And so many people, and sometimes us, lives as different kind of children. But when we come to Christ, when his light shines on us and in us, we become the children of God. Years ago, I was in Bethlehem, of all the places I was in Bethlehem, and we walked into the area. It's a cave. Christ was most likely born in a cave. And we walked into the cave where Christ was likely born or certainly within just a short distance from there. We walked into the cave and we read the Christmas story of Christ being born in Bethlehem. And then the bishop who read the text said, I'd like you to think right now, not of Bethlehem, but I'd like you to think of the place where you were when Christ was born in your heart and in your life. Where, he said, is your Bethlehem? Where is your Bethlehem? And I would ask you this morning as we worship God to renew your faith or begin your journey in faith, to believe in Christ, to believe that he is the perfect image of God and that he has come to us to speak to us a message of kindness and grace and truth that matters and has the power to change us and change our lives and make us the children of God. Let's bow our heads. Almighty God, we thank you for Christmas. We need the light and grace and love of Christmas so very, very much. We pray, O oh God, that you will be born in us today. That you'll be born in our humble hearts and make us like Christ our Savior. We pray that the music and the food and the homecomings and the celebrations and the worship and the sermons will all draw us close to you and increase our faith. In our Savior's name we pray to you. Amen.